Good evening. On behalf of Baptist Health, um, I want to welcome you uh, to tonight's um, third and final session um, from our, of our LGBT health series um, titled Disparities in Healthcare. Um, I'm Glenn Charles, uh, Community Partnership Coordinator with Social Responsibility. And before we get started, um, just want to go over a couple Zoom housekeeping uh, options for you. So just remind you, the session is being recorded. So if you have to, if you have to leave for a second or if you know if someone wants to uh, listen to the recording, um, it will be available hopefully another week or two. Um, throughout the session, please use the Q&A option um, if you have questions. Um, as the chat can be a little confusing and sometimes uh, depending on how many people are are submitting uh, chats, it can we can lose those questions. So please use the Q and A option, which is as you see in the red square. Um, if you do want to submit comments um, about what's going on in the session, uh, things are the things that pertain to you in terms of how uh, if they relate to the things option. Uh, sorry, if things relate to you based on what you're here or you just want to make a general comment, please you can use the chat option for that as well. But to get started, I would like to introduce our moderator for the night, uh, Brian May. Brian is a local resident of Jacksonville, born and raised on the west side of town. As an educator at Baptist MD Anderson Cancer Center, he supports new employees coming into the revenue cycle with onboarding and training. When he is not in the classroom, Brian serves as a co-chair of Baptist Pride Employer Resource Group, which aids efforts to provide a safe, inclusive, and equitable environment for LGBT plus patients, families, team members, and the community. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian May. Thank you, Glenn Wood. I'm honored to be today's moderator, especially on such an important topic of healthcare disparities, eliminating health disparities and enhancing efforts to improve LGBT plus health are necessary to ensure that LGBT plus individuals can lead long, healthy lives. So social and structural inequities, such as a lack of education and training for healthcare providers, restrictive health benefits, and the fear of discrimination can lead to increased risk for a number of health threats. In order to address these disparities, we must first understand why they are occurring and how they are negatively affecting the LGBT plus community. To discuss this topic, we have joining us Dr. Michelle Aquino. Dr. Aquino is a doctor of osteopathic medicine and an internal medicine hospitalist for Baptist Health. She attended Western University, College of Osteopathic Medicine of the Pacific in Panoma, California, completed her internship at Suncoast Hospital in Largo, Florida, and did her residency at UF Shands here in Jacksonville. Dr. Aquino is a Action News Jackson's medical expert and is a proud mother of two children. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Aquino. Dr. Aquino, thank you for joining us, joining us this evening. How are you? I'm doing well, Brian. I'm very happy to be here and uh, spread some good information about an interesting topic. And hopefully at the end of this, we all know a little bit more about uh, LGBTQ plus healthcare and the disparities. Awesome. Thank you again for joining us. So let's dive right in, shall we? Um, question one, the reason why we're here, um, what causes health disparities for the LGB, LGBT plus community? What do you see? All right, I'm going to try to focus on a few uh, big points in this talk because I'll tell you right now, we can talk about all these issues and it'll take about six, seven hours to do it thoroughly. Okay, so we're not here for that long. I just really want to give some good bullet points uh, and have people really see if things resonate with you. Uh, I hope everyone learns a little bit something. I know I learned quite a, uh, quite a bit doing my research for this uh, and hopefully we'll have a nice, clear, uh, seamless talk. And again, we'll all be a little more educated uh, at the end of this. So what causes health disparities in any minority group? Uh, there's a lot of similarities, a lot of intersectionality, but let's focus on the LGBTQ plus group right now. And so I'm gonna go down a few, uh, a few issues that I know uh, is gonna resonate with a lot of people listening to this talk. So first one is of course the minority status. Listen, if we are not a cisgendered Caucasian male in America, you are likely a minority, right? And more of a minority, the more minority you are, uh, the harder, the uh, more difficult it is uh, to get good health care, really. Uh, and so just being a minority is, is part of that issue. Uh, another thing is uh, lack of health care training. Uh, health care, when we talk about health care, we're talking about a huge group of people, right? The highest educated um, person in that is usually the medical doctor, correct? 
and then everyone else has a different type of education, extensive education uh, on medicine, on, on drugs, on mental health, and psychiatry. There's so many different aspects of healthcare. So when we say healthcare, I'm talking about a large group of people, okay? And imagine if this large group of people that work in the hospital, work in the clinic, draw your blood, listen to your lung, do your EKGs, do your x-rays, all these different people, not just the doctors and nurses, if we all were educated on LGBTQ plus healthcare. We aren't, the fact is we aren't. And so this leads to more disparities, unfortunately, okay? Other thing is lack of clinical research. Myself as a doctor, when I do things for certain patients or I'm looking for things in certain patients, I think, are they male or female? What is their age? Uh, what are the things I need to be worried about in that person in that age range? Well, when you throw in someone who is trans or is bisexual or gay, depending on their age, depending on their gender, uh, all these things, also sexual orientation, all these things need to be taken into account to give good health care. And so we don't have any good data for this group of minorities. We really don't. Also, fear. Fear plays into the disparities that we see. How many people in this minority group that are watching this right now can say that they've been discriminated against? And from that discrimination, you develop fear. You don't want to be discriminated against. You're worried about uh, reaching out for any health care because you don't want that negative experience. So all these issues contribute to the health care disparities that we see in the LGBTQ plus uh, uh, minority group right now. A lot of them, and again, these are the major ones I want you to focus on today. Thank you, thank you. Um, so what are the effects of discrimination? How does that, um, how does that affect the patient uh, when they've been discriminated against? What do you see? Quite a bit of things, okay, quite a bit. And I'm just gonna, again, focus on a few. One of them is uh, mental health, right? I mean, you're discriminated against, that is a negative experience, this negativity coming at you, uh, and we're human. We're human. So how are we going to uh, how are we going to experience healthcare? If you experience it in such a negative way, it's going to lead to mental health issues. It's going to lead to physical um, issues from the stress from having this, these uh, discriminatory uh, experiences. Definitely. Uh, also, you want to think about the hostile climate. Correct. If you have ever been in a situation where not only someone was discriminatory, but they were also hostile, right? Where you've been in that situation where someone said something nasty to you. Uh, imagine supposedly a professional person in healthcare saying something nasty to you when you go and get your blood. I mean, what kind of experience is that? That is such a negative experience and that just leads to more stress. And so all this stress, be it mental, be it physical stress, really we internalize a lot of this stress and that leads to medical issues and worse outcomes for LGBTQ plus people. So definitely this, you know, discriminatory um, um, efforts on other people's parts really is not a good thing for you, definitely. Uh, so really we talk about minority stress, right? This minority, you deal with this stress day in and day out, uh, which leads to not good outcomes. Uh, and some of the things that we can do to help with this type of minority stress that you're dealing with from all these discriminatory practices and hostile uh, you know, uh, attitudes of people is, uh, number one is acceptance, right? Do you want your community? Do you want family support, community support? That's gonna help give you acceptance and be able to deal with some of these issues a little bit better and help decrease your stress level. Uh, other issue you want to think about is if you have affirming healthcare, right? You have a medical doctor that takes care of you, sees you, sees that you are a cisgender lesbian, right? Or a trans male, and they see that, they see you, they're gonna understand better what you're going through and they're gonna give you better health care. And so they're gonna help you alleviate that stress that you're receiving and hopefully help you be healthier. So those are some of the things that we can help. Having good support system and having a good health care system is gonna help you with that stress. Now, Dr. Aquino, um, when you're de describing the effects, you know, you mentioned mental health, um, an increase in stress. Um, I personally, you know, I work at the Cancer Center, uh, Baptist and Anderson Cancer Center. I have um, serviced or, you know, cared for a patient who is um, male to female. 
and um, she was very reluctant um, to come see us um, because of you know disparities that she or discrimination that she's faced um, when seeking health care previously. Um, you know, once she got in and we treated her with a smile and treated her as a unique individual for who she was, you know, she opened up and expressed that, you know, I've actually been putting this off for about three to, you know, three years or so coming to an oncologist just because she was fearful um, of how she may be treated once she got here. So um, would it be safe to say that, you know, a possible effect of discrimination in healthcare is possibly neglect of healthcare? Is that a fair statement? Absolutely, neglect. Imagine if you're dealing with all this stress and you just don't want to address it. You don't want to go there because it's such an uncomfortable experience, right? You feel uh, you feel like someone doesn't see you, someone doesn't acknowledge you, uh, feels debasing, right? And so I think if you're feeling all these things, why would you want to go to a healthcare professional to treat you and make you feel bad about yourself? And so that way, that neglect does lead to undiagnosed medical issues. And that's scary. You yeah. know, that is very scary because it happens every day. I know where I'm preaching to the choir. I know I'm preaching to the choir. And so I, I think this uh, conversation is good, not only for uh, everyone that's tuning in, but for myself. I mean, getting better educated about these issues and just being more aware. I'm Listen, I'm a very, let's say, woke person, I like to think, but there's still, we can always learn right? Yeah. We can always learn. And for someone like me to be able to read some of the information I read to get prepare myself for this talk, for me to learn things that I was like, oh, I, I wasn't aware of that. Okay, that's something I need to be aware of. Yeah. Imagine someone who really has no education about LGBTQ plus, you know, issues. Uh, and that's a healthcare person. Imagine that person, how much neglect is going on and, and not purposeful neglect. They just don't know. I right. don't know. So thanks for bringing that up. That's a great point. Neglect is also a big issue that leads to more healthcare disparity. Awesome. Um, so what are some ways that we, um, we being, you know, peers, co-workers, just normal civilians, if, if there is anything that we can do without clinical expertise, how can we improve LGBT plus health? One of the things I think that um, you can do in this minority group, and it's very specific to this minority group, right, is something um, called um, SOGI data. That's going to be one of the questions. I'm kind of jumping ahead to one of the questions. But in other words, when you go to a healthcare provider, identify yourself properly, right? Say, I am a gay man or woman. I am lesbian. I'm a, a bisexual. I'm a trans male. I'm a trans female. Mm -hmm. uh, and identifying your sexual orientation and your gender identity, that's important by identifying yourself, that's gonna help ultimately uh, lead to better healthcare. So that's on, that's on you to identify that, uh, but I also think it should be on us too. This is one of those things that we in healthcare are falling behind. I think we're getting better, we're getting more educated about it, but unfortunately right now, I think a lot of it is gonna be on you to say, hey, just so you know, Doc, I'm a lesbian. I've been in a relationship with my partner for 15 years, and you just need to know that as my background. So if someone doesn't ask you, I think it's important information that you're going to have to say. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm just, that's, that's putting yourself out there because sometimes you're not going to get that positive feedback like, oh, thanks for sharing that. That's good to know. It's important information. You know, sometimes you might have that discriminatory experience or that negative hostile experience, uh, which I'm sure has happened. You know, I'm sure it has happened. Um, but I think identifying that is uh, those issues is going to help you get better health care with the right health care provider, you know, with the right physician. So that's definitely one thing that you can do yourself and empower yourself a bit. Okay, now that leads me to a follow up question. So in my role, I used to work on the front line as like a registration agent um, here at the Cancer Center. And within our demographics at Baptist Health, we do inquire like there are fields for legal and birth sex to differ differentiate the two. Um, and currently I'm a trainer, so I teach the new hires, you know, how to ask that question and why that data is important. Um, but I don't, me personally, I don't think I have all the answers. Why is it important that we collect that, you know, sexual orientation or gender identity data for your healthcare? How does that translate into the clinical care or, you know, what's the purpose of that? So as a doctor, I see a patient and when I see that patient, if you're coming in for you know, an acute issue, that's one thing. But if you're coming in and saying, I just wanna make sure things look good, dog. You know, I wanna come in and check in with you. What do I need to be checking up on? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's when my education level comes into effect, okay? Uh, 
Brian, you come into me and I see a young African-American man. My first thing I'm going to ask is, let's talk about colon cancer. Brian, do you have colon cancer in your family? Do you know that you need to get colon cancer screening at 45? That's the screening I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about cholesterol screening. Uh, and those are the things I'm going to talk about. Blood pressure, sugar screening. I'm probably not going to address STDs. I'm not going to address HIV. I'm not going to address PrEP treatment, right? Unless I know, uh, unless you share that information with me, you share with me that, hey, I'm a gay man. I, you know, I have sex with men and I uh, am in that relationship and I need you to be aware of that for the risk factors that I need to be aware of. Educate me, doctor. Unless you tell me, I don't know to educate you, okay? Uh, and so that's one thing, okay? Just so we know and are aware of what we need to help let you know uh, what screening you need to be aware of. The other thing is, if you ask me, hey, Dr. Aquino, I am a bisexual 34-year-old man, uh, and what are the things I need to be aware of? I got to be honest. I'll be like, uh, you know what? Let me Google. Let's see. Let's learn together because I, yeah. I don't have a lot of education on that issue. And even if I Google it, there's not going to be a lot of studies on that issue. Why? Because the data is not there. One of the key things to help healthcare disparities in any minority group, particularly this minority group, is we need for you to identify yourself so that we can do better uh, and start collecting data. Because not only is it LGBTQ+, each category in that is going to be a different type of data that we need to collect. Every um, category in that issue, uh, I'm sorry, in that minority group, each of you have different things we need to be aware of, right? Uh, a gay man that has sex with men, different uh, risk factors, correct? Versus a trans man, different risk factors, right? So there's different things we need to be aware of. And it all starts by you telling me who you are, your sexual orientation, and your gender identity, okay? Number one. And the next step is on us to collect the data. And with time, hopefully, we can get more and more data on patients and have better data you know going forward five years from now hopefully i'll be able to say oh you're a bisexual 34 year old man from the data we know that at your age with your experiences this is the things we need to be worried about this is the things that we find higher in your age group or uh, you know your uh your sexual orientation this is what we need to be worried about and right now it's really tough for me to say that there's some things we know about certain groups but all the groups across the board, we don't know enough about all of them to really educate everyone properly. So we need to educate ourselves. You yeah. all need to help educate us. And then together, hopefully, we'll get more information, more data, more studies will be done, and then we'll overall get more education back and do better and keep that process. That's how we do it, okay? So let, let me give you guys an example. When you think, when you hear Framingham study, okay, a Framingham is a little city somewhere, I think it's in Boston, and it's the Northeast somewhere. And this is where back 1950s, 1940s, they started studying men, Caucasian, I don't know if they were cisgender, I don't know, or if they were trans men, but they were men. And the majority of them, they were monitored. And these are the, the group of men that we started saying, wow, look, they all have heart attacks at this age. Hmm, controlling blood pressure helps prevent heart attacks. Uh, controlling cholesterol helps prevent heart attacks. How do we know all these things with any degree of uh, significance? Because we've studied all these men for years and years and years and years. So now we have the data to say this, right? How many people are watching me right now that are on a cholesterol medicine? Why? Because we've done these studies for so long, we know that if you're on cholesterol medicine, you decrease your chance with lower cholesterol of having a heart attack. How do we know that? Because we have studies. And the LGBTQ plus minority group, we don't have enough studies to really know what is specific to your group and what we need to worry about. So that's what's important. We need the data. That's very interesting, Dr. Aquino. You know, I'm no clinician, but you know, it's like, there's studies run on practically everything you can think of, except us, you know, the LGBT plus community. So hopefully, you know, we have some change makers out there in the healthcare industry that can, you know, band together and start up an initiative to focus on this because it is an important topic. It um, is definitely important. And, and I do want to say, I, I, part of the frustration of that education, it does fall on you. If you're within that minority, you're just going to have to educate. And I, and I hear, I hear the feedback of saying, you know what, why is it my job to educate you? 
you know what, it just is unfortunately where we're at. I think going forward, the onus is not going to be on you to educate because we're all going to be better educated. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, you do have to do some education. You know, it's interesting because my 19 and 20 year old girls, uh, you know, when we talk about these issues, they're like, you know, yeah, mama, I'm a uh, cisgender uh, woman. Uh, I'm a cisgender female and I'm straight. And my pronouns are, are she and he or she and her. I mean, they say this without even thinking about it because that generation is getting better educated. You know, my generation, we didn't get any of this. My older generation, they, you know, don't know how to deal with this. But I think it's, as time goes on, we are going to get better educated. But until then, it's going to fall on you if you're a minority in, if you're a group in this minority, you're just going to have to keep educating when you're given the, you know, the, uh, the opportunity to do so. Awesome. So what I gather from that, because, you know, how can we improve? Those are like action items, you know, next steps. What can we do? All of, all of the attendees and those who have you at a later time, what can you do today um, to improve this? So I gather from that, educate, you know, whether you are a part of the community or have a loved one who's in the community, just educate others, um, you know, on being empathetic, how to be attentive, some of the nuances that people um, within that demographic or that minority group face and suffer with. And then also I think what we can do, Dr. Aquino, is advocate. Well, you know, they're kind of the same. So like if you are also, if you are not, a member of the LGBTQ plus minority, um, be an advocate for us, speak up when we're not in the same room, you know? Right. Um, so educate and advocate are ways that we can improve healthcare for LGBT plus minorities. Definitely, I think we all have to be allies. And, and really, if you think about it in this way, again, if you're not a uh, cisgender Caucasian male in America, you're likely a minority, correct? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it really, it is. So all of us should be allies for everyone, all the minorities, right? We should all be allies. And so this is just an, an ongoing issue that we need really need to advocate for uh, whatever minority we are in and for the other minority. You know, we always need to be advocating. I'm a Latina woman. You know, I'm a brown girl in Jacksonville. Uh, I'm a female, I'm a doctor, but I am a female uh, and I'm Latina. So I have a significant amount of privilege being a physician. I admit it, I own it, and I use it the best way I can to educate as much as I can about being a woman doctor, being a Latina doctor, being a mom doctor. So, you know, I'm, I'm doing it for my own minority. Um, and obviously I'm an ally for the other minorities. So it's just, it's important, educate, advocate, and be an ally whenever possible. Yeah, awesome, thank you. So Dr. Kino, you know, healthcare, um, goes beyond just seeing a doctor, taking medication, you know, all the normal stuff, uh, which we know as social determinants of health. Um, what are some of other contributors um, to a healthy life for an LGBT plus individual? Healthy life. Okay. So some of these are, are very basic and, and it's, and it's, it, it's sad. It really is sad to me when I was, you know, looking over all the data for this talk, it just made me sad that I have to mention something like safety. Mm, yeah, that's a big that, one. That makes me sad. Yeah, that made me yeah. sad. When we think of uh, especially our uh, trans women of color, mm -hmm. okay, our trans uh, women of color, you know, they're not safe. We see it all the time. You're seeing people being murdered, being a hurt, being beat up, you know, all this um, trauma happening to them um, by someone else. And you also see it, uh, you know, by themselves, suicide, mental health issues, suicide, uh, um, suicidality is obviously high in, in the LGBTQ plus population also. Um, so safety is something to help everyone feel better and be healthier and be better. Um, so that's one, safety. Uh, the other one is just good healthcare, right? You want uh, access to good healthcare. What does that mean? You just wanna have a doctor who understands when you identify yourself and you give them their, you know, your SOGI data. I'm a uh, cisgender lesbian. Okay, good. I know that. Click, write it down. It's like telling me whatever else, whatever other fact about you, right? I'm going to write it down and do the best I can to make sure I'm up to date on the most recent information about what I need to do to help guide you to stay safe. So you want good health care. You want inclusive health care. So safety, inclusive health care. And the other thing I think overall is acceptance. And this is more for the mental health issue. Mm -hmm. I talked earlier about stress and how we have stress from, you know, physical stress, and then we have mental health stress, obviously. 
Uh, and I think the LGBTQ plus uh, minority group, obviously you have so many stressors, so many life stressors day in and day out uh, about being safe, right? About having healthcare that accepts you and, and not having to worry about discrimination. Uh, but the other one is just acceptance in your, when you find your people, you know, be it family, the family you were born in or the family that you find, you know, but having that acceptance I think also leads to uh, healthier outcomes, healthier lifestyles, uh, better overall, uh, you know, in terms of less stress level and uh, health. And so those are three basic things. Imagine being accepted, mm -hmm. being safe and having access to good health care. I think those three things are going to help people lead better, healthier lives. Awesome. Um, what are some issues that will need to be evaluated? And, and addressed over the coming decade if we hope to improve the you know health care for LGBT plus communities? I think there's two basic issues, okay? One of them is data. We've mentioned the data. We need more studies. We need more data. There's not enough data. And so when you go to your doctor, you need to keep educating them, tell them who you are, tell them your sexual orientation, your uh, gender identity. And this is just something we're going to need to do. And it's going to be going forward, it's going to be a normal, it's going to be a new normal. You know, it's interesting in the hospital when I'll see patients and I'll see some 84 year old Baptist male who's in there for pneumonia, right? And they're like, why, why did they ask me my gender? I don't understand that Dr. Aquino. And some people are receptive to the conversation and some people are not receptive to the conversation. Mm -hmm. It is what it is, right? There's certain people who are not going to change their mind, but you know what? They're having that conversation. And so that's what's important because we keep having the conversation and we keep going and we keep going and eventually it's going to be a normal conversation. We're not there yet, but we keep going. Okay, so data gathering and that conversation is important. And the other one is education, education, education. That's what we need to do over the next few years, the next 10 years, the next decade, next 20 years going forward. Endless education. I want to give you guys a few points in education. What I mean by that parenting. We have to teach parents how to parent, you know, these baby gays when they're 14 and 15 and coming out to their parents and they're saying, mom, I'm queer or mom, I'm gay or dad, I'm, you know, I'm so-and-so or whatnot when they're identifying themselves, uh, when they're uh, identifying their sexual orientation and saying, oh, this is interesting. This is what I am. This is who I am. We need to parent parents so they do better and give that support and acceptance. Okay. So that's one thing I want people to think about. Also, Elder health. We don't really think about this, but let me give you an example. Imagine you live with your partner for the last 40 years. You're a gay man here in the South. Your partner dies. You're getting older. You have to go revert back to living with your kids who never knew you were out, who never knew that you had a partner, right? Never knew you were gay. So you hear cases of this when you have these elderly people, elderly LGBTQ plus people that have to go back into the closet is how you say it. Can wow. you imagine that? Why I've, I've never would have, wow. Yeah. Think about that. Think about that. When your family does not know the true you and you've lived your life for so long and then, you know, situations happen where you're getting sicker or financially you have to go back and move in with one of your kids and they never knew. You have to go back into the closet. Can you imagine that thought process? Ugh. So that's something, yeah, education. We need to educate so that doesn't happen. Also, wellness models. What is a wellness model? A wellness model is when we say, okay, a 35 year old healthy woman wellness should look like this. This is the things we check for. This is what we need to know about them. This is what the weight needs to be. This is what the cholesterol needs to be. The sugar needs to be. Do you know what though? Do we have an LGBTQ plus wellness model? We don't have one. I can't tell you what a healthy 45 year old trans woman should look like. We don't have that information. I, I can come up with it. I think I'm um, intelligent. I'm a doctor. I have the medical knowledge and I'm also an empathetic individual and I'm a huge ally. So I'll come up with it. I'll come up with what I think that should be, but we don't have a standardized, you know, we don't have that standardized person. So we need that. We need that uh, wellness model, lesbian wellness model, uh, you know, bisexual wellness model, transgender wellness model, uh, you know, um, asexual wellness model, all, all these, we need all these wellness models. We don't have them. How do we get those? data. Another thing I want to mention uh, is also uh, the uh, violence. I was, we talked about it a little bit earlier about feeling safe and violence. Education against violence is important also. That's something that we need to keep uh, advocating and keep going forward 
uh, and making sure that you know people are not getting targeted for being who they are. That's ridiculous, right? Yeah. So these are some of the things that we need to think about. It's interesting, Brian, because I think I just your mind went when I said that elder issue. Yeah, yeah I, didn't, I never thought about that. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. Well, I've heard of that. Yes, that does happen. You know, something else that you mentioned earlier that reflecting on, I realize I'm not currently doing it and, and I have no reason not to, is to properly identify myself with my healthcare providers. You know, right. um, from what I can remember, you know, when I first entered the office as a new patient, I don't remember them asking, but it's all, there's nothing stopping me from providing that information as well. Um, right. ident you know, identifying that I am, I am a gay male, um, just so when things come up, or if I have questions, you know, they understand where it's coming from and how to answer it, you know, based on my lifestyle. So, um, and, you know, honestly, I didn't understand what the benefit of that was, you know, um, but you've explained, you know, it can, um, with that information, you know, the doctor, the physician can, you know, give you um, things to be on the lookout for. Right. Um, you know, if I, if you say that you are sexually active with same sex, they can, you know, educate you on prep and things that you can do ahead of time, you know, to stay right. safe, live your lifestyle that you are, you know, that you have, but do it safely. So yeah, think about it. 35 year old lesbian, 35 year old bisexual woman, 35 year old bisexual man, and then a uh, gay men, and then a trans male, 35 year old and a trans female, 35 year old. Each specific person is going to have different healthcare needs different mm -hmm. healthcare needs, different things we need to check. And some will overlap. There definitely is intersectionality in there, but it's quite different. It's quite different. And as your healthcare provider, as your doctor, uh, I need to know that. That's important information to tell me. Awesome. Uh, I just checked into the uh, group chat. Uh, Christine, one of the uh, attendees this afternoon said medical professionals also can make you know a more eff uh, a larger effort to seek out the education and then push it out to have it included in curriculums. I definitely agree, Christine. That's a great point. Yes, um, absolutely. You know, and it's and it's interesting because again, that's two points. Number one, we don't have a lot of information, so we need to data up. gather and get more information. But on the other hand, again, I think you have to be um, a, a, not aggressive. That's the wrong word. You have to be open and inquisitive. I have been practicing in the hospital for the last, I think it's uh, 14 years. I wanna say 13, 14 years, I've been only in the hospital. I don't have any clinic. Before I came to the hospital, I was in clinic for six years. And it's interesting because I remember one of the interesting experiences I had is I had a woman, cisgender woman who came to me and they would talk about their partner as they. They would never say hear, hear her, mm -hmm. hear him. They would say they. And I intuitively said, uh, so is your partner a man or a woman? I asked her straightforward. She said it to me and she was blown away that I noticed A, the pronouns and yeah. B, I asked her, I, I needed to know, you know, what is your sexual orientation? Are you bisexual? Are you a lesbian? I just need to know that. Or, you know, are you a cisgender, you know, straight woman? I just need to know because that would change, uh, you know, the healthcare issues that I would need to be aware of. Yeah. And the conversations that we may have, you know, so exactly. I'm definitely, definitely going to start doing that. Now that I understand the benefits and how that can, um, you know, improve the healthcare that I receive from my physician. Um, it only, it, it can only help to, to, to be, you know, forthright with your healthcare provider on your sexual orientation or gender identity. So, um, well, next question. Um, it says the CDC reported that LGBT plus individuals are disproportionately greater, at, at disproportionately greater risk of COVID-19 illness. Now that's news to me. You see my face. What are some reasons that this is being observed? How does LGBT correlate to COVID-19 diagnosis? All right. So as you guys know, I'm the medical correspondent and Action News Jack. So I've been like the COVID expert is what they call me just because I keep up to date. I read a lot of the information on COVID. I'm constantly talking about it. I'm in the hospital taking care of very sick COVID patients. So it's just something that I'm very aggressive about reading up on. Okay. Uh, and what we find in this uh, COVID pandemic is LGBTQ plus uh, minority, you know, there's certain things that stick out a little more in this minority group and they thus have more severe COVID at times. They're at increased risk for having more severe COVID. So let me read a few facts to you guys and you understand what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, first of all, we know LGBTQ plus uh, minority uh, they smoke at a higher level than uh, the non-LGBTQ plus um, uh, population, okay? So when you smoke more, you have a higher percentage of smoking, 
you have a higher percentage of having lung disease. If you get COVID and you have lung disease, you're going to do worse. Okay, right. so that's one issue, point that out. Other thing, asthma. There's a 21% increase in asthma in the LGBTQ plus um, minority group versus in the non-LGBTQ plus minority group, um, non-minority group, it's 14%. So this minority group has a higher incidence of asthma. Again, lung disease, you get COVID, you're going to do worse. All right. So you're, you're hearing me here. Here's another yeah. fact that was interesting. And these facts, I, I have to be honest, I didn't know these until I did the research for this. And so it was interesting to me to be able to learn this. Adults, adults in the LGBTQ plus minority, all adults, one fifth of all adults in this minority group have diabetes. Okay. If you get COVID and you have diabetes, how do you do? You do worse. Okay. So what I think it shows is LGBTQ plus um, minority group has certain risk factors at a higher incidence than uh, you know the, the rest of the population. And so when everyone gets COVID, if you have these risk factors, you're going to do worse with COVID. And that's why this uh, minority group ends up doing a little bit worse with COVID. That's why, because of these risk factors. Here's another one I want to share with everyone. And this, this is sad. 17% of this minority group uh, is without health of insurance right now. So right now, about 17% of LGBTQ plus minorities in the United States do not have health insurance. So if you get sick with COVID, are you going to go to the hospital right away? No. If you don't have insurance, you're going to stay home and try to fight it out. And by yeah. the time you go to the hospital, you're going to be really sick. And by yeah. then, we might have already missed our window to get you better. Okay? Yeah. So not having health insurance leads to worse outcomes with COVID. And when 17% of this population doesn't have health insurance, they're going to have worse outcomes with COVID. And so that's how that works. Question, Dr. You know, um, the statistic that you pulled that data from, uh, that last um, thing about not having health insurance, do you have any idea why that may be? Why, you know, is it because we can't find jobs like employer-based insurance? If you if you have any ideas, that's that. I, you know, I it's to. interesting because uh, as I was saying, there's not a lot of data. So every once oh. in a while, I find a study and it would have these numbers, and I would try to find where the numbers came from, and it it, it wasn't very clear. Mm -hmm. But these are the numbers that I found, and I wanted to share them because I believe them; they make sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. Okay? But one thing I found, which I thought was interesting, and this is um, uh, something that was quite interesting. So since the pandemic has begun, let me read these numbers to you all. Okay, unpaid leave from work. Okay, and I think unpaid leave means you're not getting paid, you don't have money, you lose your health insurance, and that leads to worse outcomes. So this makes sense to me, but listen to these numbers. 11% of the LGBTQ plus community has taken unpaid leave since this pandemic has began, okay? So one in 10, all right? Now, out of that 11%, 27% of that group wow. is transgender. That's okay? heartbreaking. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. And so I, I don't know why, I, yeah. I don't know what's causing that significant, uh, you know, uh, number in unpaid leave. I'm not sure the reasoning, I couldn't really get good information on it, but it was definitely documented that they have seen those numbers. Mm -hmm. And so again, we need more data, right, to give you better answers. Uh, but the data we have is, is, is disturbing. It really is disturbing. Uh, with all these barriers you described, does Jacksonville have an LGBT plus specific clinic where people can feel safe, you know? Yes, I think we have some areas where you can uh, access some, uh, you can access support, you can definitely get support. And from there, you can network and I think find what you need in some areas. Uh, Jasmine, it's a youth, uh, youth community center here in Jacksonville. I was a board member for Jasmine for three years, loved it, did a lot of good stuff, a lot of fundraising. We helped open up a STD clinic on the campus at Jasmine. Uh, and so they do a lot of good things for youth. I think it's from 13 years up to, I want to say, 26 years old as the age range of people that they help there. I will say, though, they have programs for parents uh, about, you know, teaching parents how to deal with kids that are coming out to them now. So they do a lot of good education in the community, not just for the kids. So Jasmine is a great resource, great resource. Uh, the other one is PFLAG. 
parents and friends of uh, lay and guess, um, sorry, lesbian and gay people. Um, that's also a good resource. Okay, that's a great resource. Uh, and the last one I want to mention is the UNF LGBT uh, uh, Resource Center that's on the UNF campus. And again, Jasmine, the P flag and the, the Resource Center at UNF. These are great resources where if you're new to town or you're looking for a doctor, you went to your last doctor, you said, hey, doc, I'm a cisgender uh, lesbian. And they looked at you funny and they didn't know what to say to that information. You might need to find another doctor, right? So I think these are resources where you can really um, reach out to them and say, hey, I'm looking for someone in town. Do you have a list of, of doctors that are you know, LGBTQ uh, friendly? Uh, you know, I, and I think that's a good start. Um, my uh, son just came out to me. Uh, I don't really understand where, how I can support them. I support them. I just don't know how to do that well. Do you know where I can get some parenting classes? You know, this is, these are good places to start, definitely. Cool. Osvaldo, I see your comment. Um, he says, I think even the healthcare community is going to need time and education to understand all the categories and also to have the scientific and evidence-based info. Um, psychologically, there are many changes that may occur during the trans process and there's you know, not much data and documentation. Um, wholeheartedly agree. So, you know, I have to, I'm gonna have to, um, except for myself that this is, you know, this is not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen within the next two weeks, three weeks, probably not even the next year. It's gonna take time. As I was about to say, it's gonna take time um, in education. And we're gonna to have to, you know, educate those who aren't a part of the minority group, um, you know, just to spread the education. And also, you know, another important thing that we can do um, to help improve LGBT plus healthcare is advocate, be an advocate for one another. Um, even if you yourself aren't a part of that minority group, um, you may have a family member or a friend, um, and, you know, um, as an LGBT member myself, I know that, you know, life can be hard for us and me. So, um, you know, I open up to my friends and tell them the struggles that I go through. So if you are a person who an LG, LGBT plus family member or friend has expressed to you some of the disparities that they've seen in healthcare or just in life in general, you know, be an advocate, stand up for them, you know, when they're not around, or if you hear someone saying something negative, um, about our minority group, you know, don't start a fight, but just educate them, you know, yeah, educate them. It's important, Brian. You know, Brian, I want to mention something that we, we, we haven't discussed, and it's uh, education and healthcare. Let's talk about that a little bit more. And this was very eye-opening and extremely depressing. Again, I, I wish I had better news, but I, I just want to be honest and, and forthright and, and uh, you know, be honest with everyone. So I'm a medical doctor. I graduated from medical school in 2002. I went to medical school in California in LA. So, you know, I was exposed to LGBTQ plus community. Uh, they're very liberal there. It was something that was fairly normal, but I did not have any uh, education. It was more about my wanting to learn more, okay? We didn't have any classes in medical school. Uh, I reached out to uh, a bunch of uh, physicians over the last week and about 50 answered, 50 different physicians across the United States answered me. And I asked, I, I had a very simple question. When did you graduate from medical school? And in medical school, did you get any education on LGBTQ plus issues? Appallingly, I would say out of the 50 that I answered, 48 received no formal education. And this mm -hmm. is people that graduated from back in the day. I think there was someone from 97. So mm -hmm. in other words, someone who's been practicing medicine for almost 30 years to yeah. people that graduated four or five years ago. Um, appallingly lacking in education. The one person that answered that actually received great education, and this is everyone, I really want you to put your thinking hats on. They actually received uh, education in the first two years of medical school, which is all book learning. And then the third and fourth year of medical school is when you go and see patients. And they, they did a month rotation in this minority group and all the healthcare issues. Guess hmm. what state this school was in? Just a wild guess. I give you guys Wyoming. Wyoming. one guess. Where was it? <laughs> Wyoming. I'm, I'm guessing it's somewhere rural where you wouldn't expect yeah. it. It was Nebraska. Oh, wow. Okay. Nebraska. That, that blew my mind. Nebraska, yeah. of all people. And honestly, that, that speaks to my prejudice, right? That speaks mm -hmm. to my absolute prejudice. I was like, Nebraska? Yeah. I, you know, you guys are good in football, but really? Nebraska? You had good LGBTQ plus training? Yeah. yeah, that blew my mind. So So that was interesting. That was interesting. So I think it's going forward. Again, the medical schools are seeing that, listen, there's is a group of 
uh, people that we are not doing right by. We need to better uh, provide good health care to this group of people. Okay, and so we need to learn more. We need to educate ourselves. Uh, and I think part of that is, again, it's a group effort. This is all of us in this, you know, we're all in the group project. So we need to do better. I think we're slowly starting to do better, but you all need to help us stay on target and make sure you educate us also. That's important. Osvaldo, I appreciate your engagement this evening. He says, uh, he, he says I think it will become a, a specialty in the future too. What do you think about that, Dr. Aquino? Absolutely, absolutely agree with you. And, you know, the thing with medicine, as in anything else in the United States, really, it's money, right? We're a capitalistic uh, situation, so a capitalistic uh, country. Mm -hmm. So when we get insurances on board and make sure they're paying for the hormone replacements and for the surgeries, the, you know, the gender affirming surgeries and uh, paying for, you know, the regular screening that we need to do for everyone, um, I think that once you see that, schools are going to say, oh, we have people, there's enough people here that we need to start making specialists throughout the United States to make sure that we serve this minority community well. So I think going forward, that will happen. That's Not awesome. Yet, That's, awesome just to think about. That's awesome just to think about. It makes my heart smile that there may, you know, be someone specialized in LGBT plus healthcare. Yes. That's yeah. And to be honest, it's just, it, it's just, it's a need. It's a definite need. Uh, and I think if I were in clinic, I would definitely have a significant LGBTQ plus uh, amount of patients just because, again, I'm an ally, I'm very open, and it's something that I think is important and needed. Uh, but I'm, I'm in the hospital. So, you know, it's not something that I, I can do in my everyday life, unfortunately. Yeah. So before we wrap up and close, um, Dr. Kino, you said you had uh, six items that you wanted to share with us. Uh, what yeah. were those? All right, I, I have six things I'm going to talk through, and I'm going to do this in a Latin way, meaning I'm going to talk fast because I want to get them all in, okay? I'm going to mention it. And these are six health issues. So I actually looked at the data. The most re I was trying to find something recent. You know, I'll, I'll see some things from like 2001, 2004. Mm -hmm. I didn't want any of that. I got this from, I think it was 2019 that this, uh, this uh, article came out, and it was good information. Uh, and so all the information I'm getting was from the last few years. And it really is uh, the six major health risks for the LGBTQ plus community. All right. I'm just going to mention some things. I'm not going to stop. I'm just going to go down and mention because I want to make sure everyone listens. And when you hear the tidbit that applies to you, remember it. OK. And this is something you can talk with your health care provider next. OK. So the first one, let's talk about uh, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, rectal cancer and HPV. Okay, that's the first one. So in 2018, 69%, 69% of new HIV diagnoses in adolescents and adults were in gay and bisexual men. Mm. That's a heck of a lot. Okay, so what does that mean? That just means when a man comes to me and says, I'm a gay or a bisexual man, you need to have that STI talk. You have to talk about that and safe sex and PrEP. That's important, okay? Other thing they mentioned, rectal cancer. Um, gay and bisexual men that have sex with men, they were at 20 times higher risk of rectal cancer than men that don't have sex with men. 20 times higher risk of rectal cancer. Again, that's why you need to tell me you're a gay man that has sex with men, because that's something we need to be aware of. So if you yeah. come to me and tell me, you know, I've noticed when I have a bowel movement and I wipe, I'm seeing blood. Mm -hmm. I, we got to pay attention to stuff like that. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so keep that fact in mind. Okay, let's talk about HPV. We know HPV can lead to rectal cancer, can lead to cervical cancer in women, and also can lead to head and neck cancer. Okay, so in 2017, we, I'm sorry, uh, we know that HPV is found in higher percentages in this minority community, okay? So in the HPV, in the LGBTQ plus community, we find it at a higher percentage. I don't have numbers, again, this is where the data is lacking, but it's a higher incidence. And we know by having higher HPV levels, we have higher incidences of these three cancers I mentioned. Again, this is screening that needs to be happening with you and your doctor, you need to talk about this, okay? Yes, ma'am. Second issue. I I talk about. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's a lot. I'm going through, so yeah. bear with me, okay? Second issue is substance abuse, okay? Substance use and abuse, all right? So in 2018, the CDC reported 20.5% of LGB adults smoked 
versus only 15% of non-LGBTQ adults, okay? So higher smoking, higher smoking, which we mentioned earlier, remember higher smoking, more uh, lung disease, worse COVID, remember mm -hmm. that? Okay, yes, so higher smoking in this community. So be aware of that, all right? The other thing is in 2019, a study showed that uh, lay, uh, lesbian and gay people were two times as likely to be uh, alcoholic, suffer from severe alcoholism. And listen to this, bisexual men and women were three times as likely to be alcoholic and suffer from alcoholism. Mm -hmm. I would have never, I would never think to ask, you know, usually you ask people, well, how much do you drink? But you know, if I know that, I'm gonna really say, okay, so you, uh, okay, so it doesn't sound like you drink so much, but let's say, what is a bad day like? And then, yeah. you know, you get a better history. You go, well, actually on a bad day, I drink a case of beer. All right, yeah. you got yourself a binge drinker. You need to, you know, educate that person. Okay, yeah. so alcohol higher, smoking higher. Let's talk about mental health, all right? Queer and trans folks, you all suffer from higher anxiety, higher depression, higher suicidality, uh, higher eating disorders. All of these are higher in this minority group. So this is something mental health. We need to talk about mental yeah. health across all the minority groups, okay? Yeah. Especially you guys. Mental yeah. health is important, okay? That's another issue that as a doctor, I would bring that up with you and say, so how are you doing? How's your mental health? How are we, you know, how are we dealing with things, all right? Next one, let's talk about obesity and eating disorders, okay? A study in 2019, and I just want to mention the study so you guys know I'm getting information. I just, you know, bringing this up. Uh, a study showed that uh, bisexual and lesbian women were more likely overweight or obese, okay, than heterosexual women, okay? So higher obesity levels, higher overweight levels. And when you tell a doctor someone has higher overweight or obesity levels, that leads to blood pressure, that leads to diabetes. Okay, that's what I'm thinking as a doctor. So I want you to understand why you need to tell us these things, okay? Um, also, gay and bisexual men are more likely to have eating disorders than heterosexual men. Hmm. So one group, obesity, overweight, the other group, eating disorders. And you see, they're different groups. It's not across the board. Everyone doesn't have the same issue across the board, okay? Two more. So next one, we'll talk about breast and cervical cancer. Of course, this is for women, but this is also for trans men. Trans men need to be aware of this and discuss this with their doctors, okay? Uh, there was a study done in 2000, it's the only one I can find, and they looked at 93,000 women. And out of that group, it suggested that um, lesbian and bisexual women had higher rates of uh, breast and cervical cancer. Honestly, that's the only study I can find that gave me some kind of fact. I wish I had better information, but it said that. I can't back it up with any other information. I apologize about that. The last thing I want to talk about is heart disease. And this is important because this is across the board, okay? So heart disease, there was a study in 2018 and it showed uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual adults, there is increased risk for heart disease more than heterosexual. And we've talked about all of these increased risks in certain populations, right? Why would you have more heart disease in the LGBTQ group? We mentioned higher smoking, right? Higher smoking, more heart attacks, right? Mm -hmm. More obesity. Mm, true. Play, uh, the lesbian women, mm -hmm. higher heart attacks. Mm -hmm. More obesity equals diabetes, diabetes, higher heart attacks. Okay, you see how, how that yeah. happens? Yes. So depending on what how you identify, you're going to have certain risk factors in your category, in your group, and that will lead to other issues. And so that's why uh, healthcare, having inclusive healthcare is so important and why you need to do your part, identify yourself properly to your doctor, let them know that. And we need to do better. We always drop the ball, really. The big picture is we're dropping the ball, but we're, we're trying to do better, okay? I speak for a lot of people that I work with. Uh, I speak with a very, you know, people at Baptist downtown, the hospitalist I work with, I'm very proud of them. I always say the most diverse people in Jacksonville, I work with all of them in the hospital, mm -hmm. diverse, open-minded, liberal, uh, you know, very inclusive, very, we want to do the right thing for everyone. And so I'm happy where I work. Uh, I think we do what we can to make sure everyone has a, a good healthcare experience. And again, it's on all of us, more us than you guys, but it's on all of us. We've got to keep educating and advocating.
Yes, I was just about to say that. So yeah, we're, we've reached, this is all the time we have. Um, some things just to remember, um, educate, advocate, educate, advocate, okay? Education goes as far as, you know, includes disclosing, you know, your SOGI data with your healthcare provider, SOGI being sexual orientation and gender identification, okay? So educate and advocate. Um, I do want to thank everyone for your engagement in the comments. I want to thank Dr. Aquino for presenting on such an important topic. It was truly a pleasure to, moder to moderate this evening. Um, if there are any further questions, feel free to put them in the comments. Um, we can always reach back out to you one way or another uh, to get those questions answered. Um, but at this time, I want to turn it back over to Glenwood. Thank you, Brian. That was <laughs> very informative. Um, I, very, I really enjoyed the conversation you all had. Um, it was just a constant reminder, Dr. Aquino, of, of how little I don't know and how much I really need to learn. Um, it's just join, join so. the group, join the group, <laughs> all of us. That's okay. So I will definitely, I might be leaning on you uh, just to learn a little bit more about LGBT plus community and just what we need to be doing, um, especially with my work in public health. So thank you all. Thank you both. And thank you, um, audience, for just being so engaging. Um, unfortunately, though, this is our last session of the year. Um, but if you did miss out, I'm trying to pull up a screen, share the screen. Um, if you did miss our previous sessions, they are available on our social responsibility website. So that was the prep um, we had on June 3rd and depression, substance use and suicide on July 15th. So subjects that Dr. Kino did um, mention in terms of some, some of the areas um, of concern when it comes to LGBT plus health. Uh, we are looking to continue to see the series next, next year, 20, 20, uh, 2022. So hopefully you'll join us then. Uh, we will be sending a link out for this recording as well. So if you wanna share that uh, with anyone who misses, misses session, um, that'd be great. Um, so we'll follow up with an email with um, that recording and this link as well if you don't, um, if you didn't catch it. Um, but again, just wanna say thank you. I just wanna let you know that um, at Baptist Health, we are committed to a lifetime of healthcare for good. Um, and so on behalf of Baptist Health, I just wanna say thank you and good evening.